Continuing on with our study of the epistle to the Hebrews, turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 5. For every priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he also is compassed in, with in infirmity, and by reason thereof he ought, as for all the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honour unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified himself, not himself, to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. As he also saith in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing that ye are dull of hearing. For when, for the time, ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to him to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. By way of reminder where we're at with the epistle, we're dealing with the God who speaks, the God of creation, the God who in ancient times has revealed himself to the prophets and to the fathers through their writings, and in these last days has spoken unto the Jewish people by his Son, the one who is heir of all things, the one who made the worlds, he created everything. You realise today, in the galaxies, we've still got no understanding of exactly what's up there and how much is out there. We still cannot fathom how every single particle of gas and every single particle of creation works together. How it's all united. We've still got no understanding of how all that can happen in perfect harmony and continue to happen. We, we know nothing. We know relatively nothing in comparison to what what really is out there in this world and, and he, he made all that. He created all that. He's the brightness of the glory of God. He's the express image of the person of God. Do you want to know anything about Jesus Christ? Do you want to know anything about God? Well you're not going to learn anything about Jesus Christ that you're not going to learn in the Bible because it was written by those who knew him. And you're not going to know anything about God by looking outside of Jesus Christ. That's the reality. And he himself, God himself, purged our sins by being crucified. And then he ascended after the resurrection. He defied nature. He defied every single law that we know by the resurrection, which is in, in, impossible. It's impossible for a man to come alive again after he's been crucified. God's the God of the impossible. And then he ascended into heaven, and he sits down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He went back to his original place. He's superior to angels, greater than angels. He created them. They worship him. He doesn't worship them. And he's the, the God who loves righteousness. He's the God who, who, who hates iniquity. He has a hatred of iniquity. That's breaking his law. That's evil. And he's the beginning, the foundation of the earth. Everything is the work of his hands. All the things that we know, all this stuff that we have, is all going to perish away but he will remain. Because of who he is, we have to pay attention to Jesus Christ. We have to pay attention to him, the word of God. Christ is preeminent, he's more important than Moses. He's more preeminent, he's more superior to Moses. And he's the one who sanctified us, and he's superior to angels, he's superior to Aaron, he's superior even to the, the person of the high priest. He's superior. And because of this, because of who he is, 
And because of this danger of this original sin, we have to exalt one another, one another daily. That's what the original church did from Hebrews 3.13. They met every day. They exalted one another daily. They didn't do this Sunday twice a day, twice a Sunday, and then meet on a Wednesday and so on. And then other days in the week. They just, they just met all the time. That was what the church was. It was people. Still is, but essentially we changed things. But because of unbelief and this corruptness of original sin that's still within us, which we are yet waiting for it to be completely done away with at the end, when Christ returns or when we die, we, we're freed from sin altogether. And because of that unbelief, that hardness of heart that's still within humanity, we've got to be aware of that. Because it's like... Let me make this, this point. You have a disease. Right? We all have a disease. It's called sin. Now you have a disease and you're cured of that disease. And you go to the doctor and the doctor says, I have good news for you. You're cure. You're free. But this is the condition. You've got to change your ways. Because you've got the danger that if you don't alter your lifestyle, you've got the danger of this disease coming back. And the next time, I can say to you, the next time it could kill you. Sin is like that. If we let sin have dominion over us, once we've been freed from it, the danger of it coming back is you're worse than you were before. And they're the dangers. And that's the danger of unbelief. Unbelief will take us back if we deny Jesus Christ and we don't abide. Which no one here is going to do that. No one who is saved here is going to do that. But these are the warnings given. Because if we slacken off on the gospel, that's what happens. There's no other way. Man must sin. According to original sin, man must sin. He can't do anything else. It's who he is. And we've got to quench that. And we've got the power now because we've got Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit living within us. He's given us that, that authority. It's time to be adults and wake up. And because of this, the Word of God is more powerful. He's telling us that you can't hide away in unbelief because the Word of God is more powerful than any sharper than any two-edged sword. And the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the hearts, he knows everything about us. Nothing, no creature is hidden from him. And so on. And then he moves on in chapter 5 to who in the days of his flesh, about Jesus Christ, when he'd offered up prayers and supplications, showing the extremities of what Jesus actually went through, which we've covered from verse 7 and 8 of chapter 5. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. We dwelt three weeks on, on the passion of the things that Jesus went through. And one of the, one of the things, when, when Jesus was crucified, to assure people that he was dead, there is no debate that he was dead. When that Roman soldier thrust that spear up into his side, you know, we don't know if it was the left side or the right side, but when they thrust, it, it probably was, it was the side where the heart was on, it's, it's pretty much clear, because when they thrust that up, and it says, the, the text says, the blood and the water flowed. What that shows to us is the condition of Christ when uh, the, the extremities of how he'd been, how much he'd been scourged. It gives us that insight because when blood and water flows from a dead body, there's a reason for that. But well, what happens is because of the, the extremities of the way Jesus, Jesus was was scourged and the, the loss of blood that he had, the body attempted to recirculate the blood loss around the body. So when Jesus was losing constant blood, his heart would have been attempting to have pumped blood around his body, and it would have been working at an extreme rate, which would have caused a low blood pressure and swelling, and fluid swell-ups around, around the heart, and, 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 he, and the, even the lungs would have been, would have been damaged by it. And it would have been continuously, his heart would have been overworking. And that's when he, when he collapsed, when he was to carry the cross. He collapsed probably because of low blood pressure. And then when it comes to the Roman soldiers, the Roman soldier thrusting that lancea spear into his side, the blood and the water flowed. The, 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 that was a result of the extreme sufferings that had been pushed upon his heart. 
But we know, we know this now and that, that somehow shows us the accuracy of, of the writers because it's actually, it's actually known, as, known as shock in, in, the modern, in, in the modern medicine world. But that shows us the authenticity of the writing because no one could have made that up. No one could have made that up. It had to have either happened or not. You could make it up now because you could, you could create fiction and just make that up. But these are the things that we know. When, when he was crucified, when he died, he was dead. He was absolutely dead. And then he came alive again. Verse 9 of, of 5. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Right. First thing that I have to notice here is... For one, this, this, this word being made perfect. And first is, is that in verse 8, you've got that semicolon again. Right? So, you know, you know the semicolon, you'll see it in your text. That's meaning that the verse 9 is going to continue on again with the same theme, but it's continue, going, to, going to explain it somewhat. So, when you have that semicolon, and then you have the Greek word chi, and means it's going to continue, it's continuing on. So it's not just like isolated verses. And being made perfect. So you ask, ask the question here. How could Jesus be made perfect when he was perfect and he was without sin? How, how, why, why would he say that, being made perfect? Is he implying that Jesus had an imperfection? I don't think so. Is he implying that he was made perfect by the works that he did? I don't think so. No, I think in the context of this, he's talking here about having to fulfill the requirements of salvation. In other words, he's implying that perfection is completion. So when it says that he's been made perfect, it means he completed what he came to do, having, having died, having obeyed the Father and then rising again from the dead. It signifies that he's obtained the goal. And that's, what it mean, that's essentially what it means in the Greek as well. It means that he's fulfilled the requirements for salvation, as when he said on the cross, it is finished, it is accomplished. He himself had perfected the flesh. You've got to get that. He perfected the flesh. Being made flesh, he now perfected it by his own death. Because death was a judgment for sin. There was no reason for Jesus to die because he wasn't a sinner. No reason. But him laying down his own life, surrendering his own life. Pilate marveled when he, when he, he was dead so soon. Because he, he gave up the ghost, that's what the text says, he gave it up. He became the author of eternal salvation. Having been made perfect. So he became the actual salvation for those who believe and the potential saviour for everybody, essentially. So when he says he became, in the Greek this is, this is actually to have come into being. Because there's a difference, isn't there, between a plan and then for it actually to unfold and actually happen. So you see things that are predestined but in the foreknowledge of God, they're already there, but they hadn't actually come into being. This is actually coming to being now. That's what, it, that's what it means. So, being made perfect, it means he's completed it. He's completed salvation, completed what he came to do. He's perfected, he's perfected the flesh. And that's what he's done now in us. So when, when we now come to Jesus Christ and we believe in Jesus Christ, his perfection is then transferred to us and given to us. In his eyes, we are perfect. We are saved. In his eyes, that's, that's the way he sees us. He doesn't see us as, as sinners anymore. Even though we know in ourselves that we are wretches and there's no goodness in us whatsoever. We know that because we're all clothed in original sin. So, but this is only for those who obey him. So when he says, he became, became the author, that's talking about actually coming into being the, prom the promise, 
the, the, the predestined plan has actually come into actual being now. The author, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So when you talk about this word author, right, what, what is an author? But a person who writes the story from the beginning to the end. He knows the start of it, he knows where the idea came from, he knows where the whole story came from. And then he completes it. What do you think the Bible is? What do you think the Bible is? You look at all the world's religions. You look at the Quran. The Quran doesn't tell you how the world's going to end. It doesn't tell you the story from the beginning to the end. It doesn't do it. The Quran, the Quran doesn't contain prophecy. The Bible contains prophecy. It tells you distinct prophecies of things that will happen. And things that even, even in ancient times, in Old Testament times, when they hadn't happened. It even gives you the date when Jesus Christ was to go into, into Jerusalem on that donkey. Did you know that? It's the date is given to us in the prophecies. We can work that out from, from Daniel. And the author knows the beginning to the end. The Bible is the one book. The sayings of Buddha doesn't have it. The, the other um, religious texts throughout the world don't have the end of the world in them. They don't tell you how the world is going to end in such an explicit way as, as the Bible does. Even if they do, they're just copying it from the Bible. The Bible is the first one to do it. That's the author. The author what of? The whole point of the creation of the world was given for those who believe. The whole point of it was, was to redeem man, to bring a people back to God for himself. In some sense, you can't deny the implications that even, even before Adam sinned, it had somehow had already been pre-planned and pre-authored before that happened until the end. Somehow, these are the mysteries of God. He's the author of this whole book. He's the author of life. He's the author and finisher of our faith. You know, when Tyndale was translating that, he said, how can I say if he's the author and finisher or if he's, that, 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 the reader might think, well, does that mean there's an end of our faith? But we know that there is no end to our faith. It's going to go on for eternity. So when you put this word author in there, the author and finisher of our faith, it means the, complete, the completion of our faith rather than the end of it. Of eternal salvation. So what's essentially is eternal salvation. It means it never will come to an end. It means as simple as that. It is an eternal salvation. But what is the condition? What is the condition? It is unto them that obey him. It's not given to those who don't obey him. Those that obey him, you have eternal salvation. You have it. It's yours. But that's the condition. That's the condition. Never, you can think, well, you know, if, if you think about all the different theologies that are out there in this, in, this, in this world, in the Christian church and so on, you think, well, unconditional election. Unconditional election. So you say, right, okay. So you are elected and there's no condition whatsoever. Well, that contradicts it slightly because you say, well, there is a condition. Obedience. You, you can look through the entire New Testament and you will find obedience absolutely mandatory for the Christian faith. It's as mandatory as, as belief is in order for this to come into being. Jesus stated it himself. If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's what he stated. If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. He said that to the Pharisees. 
belief is absolutely, absolutely mandatory. If you look at Romans, Romans 1 and 5 in, in, in context of that obedience, Romans 1 and 5. <laughs> by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now, here we see that we've received grace, right? This is important to note here. We've received grace and apostleship. That's the work of the apostles. That's the writings that the apostles have done for obedience to the faith. In other words, you see first, what, what comes first is grace comes first and the apostleship came as a product of the grace and then obedience came as a product of the apostleship. So, if anything, what the, 16, the 17th century position of unconditional election came from, because it came from an, a, a set of articles of faith called Tulip, the, the commonly viewed as Calvinism today, but in actual fact, they have very little to do with John Calvin himself. He, he's, you know, he, he, you can almost say like the Wesleyan movement today has got nothing to do with John Wesley. Really, it's, it's, there's a lot of differences to what he actually taught. Calvin was reinterpreted quite strongly by a man named Theodore Beza, who, who came after Calvin, and then in 1618, when the Synod of Dort was developed. That's where Tulip came from. So you have total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace and perseverance to the saints. But unconditional election should have really been unconditional grace rather than unconditional election. Unconditional grace is absolutely perfectly biblical. Grace is bestowed upon all of mankind regardless of whether they believe or not. They are still under grace. The whole of mankind, the gift of grace, is given to all of them. It's unconditional. God chose to give it, whereas election is a completely different thing. You, you think of, of election, you think of, um, just, just think of it in human terms. You have a, a parliamentary election in this country, and then the person is voted in which is what God did originally, by his, pred by his predestined plan, by his, his foreknowledge. So he, he saw a people and then he elected them based, based upon that. That's, that's at least an Arminian view of it or a Wesleyan view of it. Now, does a person then who has been elected still have the role to take that role? Does he not? If you elect a prime minister into this country or, or, or a party, and they get the over, overall vote, does that person still not have the responsibility to take up that challenge and take that position? Or is it just given to him and he doesn't even have to decide? No, you still see there is an obedience required. Now, the source of the obedience in this context in the New Testament, Romans 5.19, Romans 5.19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so, by the obedience of one, shall many be made righteous. Now, that, that's talking about Jesus being the second Adam. Talking about the disobedience that Adam had by obeying his woman, rather than obeying, obeying what God had told him. The obedience of Jesus Christ, many shall be made righteous. Now, the source of that obedience, none of us would disagree, is Jesus Christ. The reason why we obey Jesus is because of him. We're not just obeying him because of ourselves, but God's given us the grace to receive him. The source of it comes from him. But the rest of the, the New Testament is literally covered in deeds of obedience. Romans 6, 16, you don't have to turn to it. Know ye not that, that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Obedience unto righteousness. You can see there that we, we are literally called to obedience. And you see the same similar thing in, in the passage where 1 Corinthians 14 and 34. 
where Paul says, let your women keep silent in the churches, for it's not permitted for them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. It's the, it's the same thing. It's deeds of obedience are to be part of fruits of the Christian life. 2 Corinthians 7, 15, and his inward affection is more abundant towards you, whilst he remembering the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling ye received him. You received him. That's mandatory for salvation. It's not going to be applied or given to anybody who doesn't obey him. All aspects of Christianity agree on this. Obedience is absolutely key to receiving, to receiving him. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts of itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The obedience of Christ. And that's our duty, is to take captive every thought. Why? Because one thought leads to another. One thought leads to another. It never stays the same. You have one impure thought, it will go up to another one, and another one, and another one. It pretty soon or other, you'll, you'll love your sins more than you'll love Jesus. And then we come to this verse here. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. That's from Hebrews. And, 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 and Peter states it as well. 1 Peter 1 and 2, elect... Right? Now get this, when I'm talking about election, there's a reason why I'm digressing. Because these are the roots of it. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. According to the foreknowledge of God. See what comes first. Election, foreknowledge comes first. Through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. You see there, firstly, election comes according to foreknowledge. Foreknowledge comes before election. So in other words, God sees in his foreknowledge and then he elects based upon that. The reformers viewed predestination and election as the plan of salvation. That they viewed the plan of salvation, that was what was predestined. And the Gentiles, you, you look in scripture, you will never find individuals predestined who were not part of a covenant plan of nations the nations were predestined, the Gentiles were predestined, the Jews were predestined. And it's always based upon nations. It's never based upon God individually selecting some to burn in hell for all eternity and some to, to go into heaven. It, it's not God. God doesn't do that. There's nowhere in the Bible does God do that. So. From this verse, what we can essentially see is, is that we clearly know the absolute certainty that obedience to Christ is equally necessary to salvation as believing on him. And that's when our salvation becomes effectual, and that's when he is the author of it. Now, when he's the author of it, that means we're written in the book. We, we are in this Bible. You believe that? We're in it. We're written in it, every one of us. Every one of us is written in his Bible. When the apostles were taking the gospel out into all the nations and fighting, when Paul was fighting in Acts chapter 15 in the council at Jerusalem, and he was, he was fighting to say, God granted the Gentiles salvation, and Peter agreed on this. What was that for? That was so the Gentile would go, it would go out, and it would go to the Roman Empire, and then it would go out into the whole world. And what for? For the salvation of souls. We are grafted in to that council meeting at Acts 15. That was done for all of us and for the generations that are going to come after we're long gone. We're in the pages of the Bible, every one of us. It's because we believe. And we believe because of the grace of God. So I think I made the point there quite clearly that obedience is, is mandatory. And that's how our eternal salvation is applied unto us. Because if you don't believe, if you don't believe, you're not going to do it, are you? You're not going to do anything if you don't believe. Verse 10. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
Now this is, this is strange. I've gone over this and thought, why? After all of that, do you just, do you just put this in? Why just all of a sudden, after all of this theme, just go back and say, called of God? So he's talking about Jesus Christ. He made perfect, he perfected the flesh, became the author of eternal salvation, called of God and high priest of the order of Melchizedek. What's the purpose of him throwing this in? Well, again, point this out. If you look in your Bible, you'll see that verse 10 is followed by a semicolon again. You see that? In the end of verse 9 you'll see a semicolon, which means it's going to continue on. And that's what the translators have done. So, verse 10 follows on from verse 9. Now, I have racked my brain over why he's put this in. What was the original author's intent? Now, when I've gone over this, I've thought, when does he do this before? So when you revert back, you revert back to 5 and 6, you see that he says, As he saith in another place, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. And then he repeats it again. Now these are the two conclusions that I've come up with. One, the author was originally still continuing on his exposition of Psalm 110 and 4. You remember from previous weeks when he's talking there about the psalm and he's still exploring the psalm he's still in his mind continuing on with that same psalm and that's why, that's why it's important to notice that what was the original author intending to communicate because the Bible has human authors another reason that I've come up with is, is that he is digressing and the reason why he's digressing is because he's going to make a further point. He's going to move further up to get to the root of this problem of what it is with this Hebrew Jewish people. Now it seems to me that another reason why he's doing this as well is because he's making a comparison between this person of Jesus Christ and Melchizedek. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I interpret that text, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, that he's mentioning Melchizedek, but he's also mentioning, he's, he's referring to Jesus Christ there. Yeah. I wouldn't say that he's directly referring to Melchizedek. Now, we all know about what we've been through previously about Melchizedek, that he is a mysterious character who appears to Abraham. Abraham has been told to leave his father's house and go and to an, uh, a land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and this, this man Melchizedek appears to Abraham and he's come from Salam Salam is the early reference to Jerusalem so there must have been a place there in Jerusalem where, where there was a high priest and there was a temple but there's no record of any high priest prior to Melchizedek if you will he's the earliest there he's, he's the very first high priest. Now the reason why he's mentioning this again is to remind the Jewish people of who we're talking about here. So in the Jewish mind Melchizedek is of the highest. Now I mentioned to you previously that in 1940s they found the Dead Sea Scrolls and in that Dead Sea Scrolls, in 11Q13, they found a, a reference, a complete scroll about Melchizedek, which gives us some insight into more into this person, because we, we didn't really have an, an awful lot. And the, they used the highest name in the Hebrew to refer to, to refer to him, which is Elohim. They refer to Melchizedek as Elohim. Now that's really surprising, because that's given to the name of to the name of God. And it's, it says this in this in this text concerning what scripture says, how long will you, plural, you all, judge unjustly, showing partiality to the wicked? The interpretation applies to Belial and the spirits predestined to him. Because all of them have rebelled, turning from God's precepts 
and so becoming utterly wicked. Therefore, Melchizedek will thoroughly prosecute vengeance required by God's statutes. Also, he will deliver all the captives from the power of Belial and from the power of the spirits predestined to him. Allied with him will be all the righteous divine beings. And then there's a, there's a gap in the manuscript. We don't know what that means. And it's, it, it refers to divine beings. But essentially what this is saying is, is that there was a people predestined to Melchizedek, which is his type of Christ. And then, if, if not, some have even interpreted it as being a, pre, pre, uh, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. So you make of that of what you will. But showing that there was a people predestined to Melchizedek, and yet even though they were predestined to him, they still rebelled and turned against him and did wicked. And what did he do? He planned a vengeance on them to judge them for their wickedness. Now there's a reason why he brings this up. It's because he's saying don't go the same way. Even though you are predestined to Jesus Christ, don't go back into your old ways, into your old wicked ways, because the injustice will go into more injustice, and eventually you'll reap the judgment of God. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what I believe. That if we depart from this faith, not that I'm saying anybody here will, I'm talking plurally in the whole of Christianity, I'm talking about all Christians, if we go back and depart, what will our judgments do? They will go worse and worse. And eventually we end up doing wicked, so much so wicked, that we then reap the judgment of Jesus Christ, who will reap it on us. That's the danger of sin. So he's, he's using it, he's digressing. And he's digressing for a purpose, to go back to the original root of the problem. The original root of the problem is sin. And the reason is, is to stir the Jewish people up, to remind them. And that's his chosen method, digressing and reminding. And going back to this most important person of Melchizedek, but we're going to cover more about him again later on, if we can, if we can find anything. But we're going to cover more about him, I think, in chapter 7. So the reason is, is that he's going back to this to stir the Jewish people up. Verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing that ye are dull of hearing. When he says this, he's clearly talking about Jesus again. We've got many things to say about him. Some things are hard to be uttered. Now, I'm going to point something out to you here, right? And you might have missed it. It's very, very easy to have missed it. Right, now let me read it again. Of whom we have many things to say. Let's see if you notice that. I'm not asking anybody to pick it out, because you're not going to pick my brain on this. But I'll read it again. Of whom we have many things to say. Of whom we have many things to say. Of whom we have many things to say. Let's see if you notice what I noticed. Do you notice that word there? we right why would an author such as Paul if Paul wrote this why would he use the word we it's a plural Greek word why would he not say of whom I have many things to say now you remember my my, my theory at least my theory that, that Paul is in this text you know somewhere in this text, but he never wrote it. Now I, I've given you, this is my 44th sermon on this series tonight, 44, I've spoken to you for about 45 to 46 hours on this book. I've never spoke so much in all my life, <laughs> right? Now I'm still of the opinion, after all them 44 sermons, I'm still of the opinion that Paul didn't write this. But when he says the word we, I think he's referring to this plurality of writers in this epistle. 
that he's talking here that I think Luke essentially wrote it down. And I think Peter was, could have been there because there's elements of Peter in this as I've shown. And then there's elements of Paul in it that I've shown. You remember when, when Paul is in jail at Mama Time prison and he says, and he's in the Second Timothy and, he's, and everybody's departed from him and he says, only Luke is with me. This fits the exact time scale of that. So I think this plurality is, 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 is talking about those three, or at least two. We've got many things to say about this. We've got many things to say about Jesus Christ, or many things to say about Melchizedek, depending on how you view it. But they're hard to be uttered. Now this, in alternate translation, would say hard to be explained, difficult to be interpreted. Because there are some things that happen which are just difficult to interpret and hard to understand. We all wrestle with them. But here, he says we've got many of these things to say. There are countless amounts of things that we could talk about concerning this. And you, and you think about this. John said in his Gospel, there are many other things that Jesus did, which if they were all written down, the world itself could not contain the books. Now, I, I, I think, John, how could, how could you say that? Was you a flat earther? Did you think the earth wasn't that big? It was just one big library, you know, because it think, but then you think, no, no, he, he wasn't a flat earther. You know, he, they believed in a, a, the biblical authors believed in a sphere. They believed in a, in a, you know, a football earth, so to speak, right? But how could you say all the things that Jesus did, if they were all written down, and talking historical, I'm not talking about us, it's talking there about what he did when he was on earth. If they were all written down, the world couldn't contain the books. Now that's huge. So what, if, if you met the apostles in the first century and, and the early Christians, I mean, they could tell you stuff that, that Jesus did that just, you know, it would just it'd be mind-blowing, wouldn't it? And it, but they've got many things to say. But they're hard to be uttered, they're hard to be explained. They're difficult to interpret them, of what is that, the Jesus spoke in parables and so on. Still, we still don't. We still wrestle with some of the interpretations of them. But he gives the reason of it. He said, because seeing that you're dull of hearing. Now, an alternate translation here would be, but would be that you become sluggish. But essentially, dull, dull of hearing is, is, is a, good, a good way of putting it. But I've got to make the point here, he's not talking about people with hearing problems. Right? You could straight away see yourself in this and say, oh, well, you know, my, my ears are bad or whatever. You know, and then you say, "Oh, well, I'm, I'm dull of hearing, so I can't hear you." He's not talking about that. You, you do realize that we don't listen with our ears. You know that we listen with our brain. Now, our ears, what they do is essentially they pick up vibrations and. Those vibrations then are sent, the signals are sent to our, 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 our brain, and then our brain computes them and understands them. This is why, I don't know if you, when you've ever spoken to people, or you've ever been debating, like I debate with people all the time, and then when I'm debating, they say, No, 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 I never said that. I never said that. Now, people have got perfectly good hearing, but I say, No, I never said that. That is not what I said. And that's why I like stuff recorded, because it's good, because you can always live them back and say, See? I didn't say that. You said that. I didn't. Your brain is interpreting what I said, and, it, and it's interpreting it wrongly. So when he's saying that you're dull of hearing, he's talking here about your, your, your brain is essentially is picking up these vibrations and... and taking them in the wrong way and interpreting them in the wrong way. You're, what you've got is a state of mind. I'm not talking about people here. If, if that thought's coming in your head, I'm not going to dig at anyone, all right? This, this was written a long time before we came in it. This is talking about the ancient Jewish people. For some reason, and I'll say this honestly, we don't know what he was getting at. We don't know what they were doing or why they become dull of hearing. Essentially, you can say that the Jewish people had a habit of forgetting their own history and turning away from God and and going and even falling for other gods. Jerusalem had become corrupted time and time again by the chosen people, people predestined to the Lord, and yet they still 
time and time again turned to false gods and Jerusalem become corrupted and even Jesus himself said you know this is the house, my house shall be a house of prayer and you turn it into a den of thieves and you think why would they be turning it into a den of thieves when all they were doing was selling sacrifices so that they could have their sins cleansed and you think that you know Jesus turned the table over and so on and he knew the heart condition because he's the word of God and the word of God knows the thoughts and intents of the heart and the joints and the marrow and everything about us and everything about people he knew what was going on there they weren't doing it for the right reasons they were doing it for money yeah. they were stealing they were stealing from the poor people and they were rich they didn't need it and that's why you, you think about that widow, widow's mite she didn't, oh, that was literally all she had that was all she had and she put it into the collection and where was that money going to? God saw, saw the intents and thoughts of the heart God saw what that person was doing and what right reason why he was doing it that's why he knew that's why Jesus said that's all she had how did he know that? how did he know that unless he was the creator who he was in all of this? So it's a state of mind, essentially what this hearing was, was a state, a state of mind. Somehow it beca- the brain become dull and, and slothful. If you look at chapter 6 and verse 12, the same Greek word, which is, which is translated as dull of hearing, or dull. If you look at verse 12, you'll see that that same Greek word is translated slothful. Translating, translations always do this. They take one Greek word and then they take it in another passage and they take the same Greek word and they translate completely different. And yet it's the same Greek word. But essentially it can mean both. Your brains become slothful. In reality, you're not listening anymore. You're not listening anymore. And, and we, th- we think. We don't know what he was getting at, like I repeat, we don't know fully what who he was talking about or why the Hebrew people would have been dull of hearing, but don't we see so much of this in Christianity today? Don't we see so much of it? Where people have just become dull of hearing because of their brains, not because of their ears. Their brains They've closed their minds off. They've become closed-minded to the truth. So much so that what do they do? They don't listen anymore. Even the Bible doesn't mean anything to them anymore. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. Let it just say it. We don't, I don't believe that. That's what people... This is what it's like. You know, in my world, I'm debating with people all the time. And time and time and time again, everybody's got their proof text. And it becomes just really tiresome. Everybody's got their proof text about this and that and this and that. And they ignore the text that refuse to believe what they don't affirm what they believe. And then they, they, people, people do this with the women leadership. I'm not digging at anybody. But people do that. They, they, I, I, was, I spoke to Church of England ministers about that. And there's, why are you continuously saying in your own articles, it says, you shall not teach in one part which is repugnant, uh, in, from one part of scripture which is repugnant to another. If anyone does that, it's not the church of Christ. So what it states in his own articles. Why then don't you just say, the Bible does teach that women shouldn't be leaders in the church, but we don't believe the Bible anymore. We're just going to go our own way. I'd say, right, fine. If you're going to do that, do that. But don't try and twist the Bible to make the Bible believe what you want it to believe. You're corrupting it. Now, and I can state this with all honesty. I do not stand up here and preach what I believe. Now, that doesn't mean I don't believe what I preach. But I don't take the text and make it believe what I want it to believe and then deliver it. It's not what I do. My job is here to say what the text says. I don't give a donkey whether it contradicts anybody's beliefs or my own. It's what the text says that's more important. 
But in reality, we don't, we don't see much of this in the Christian church anymore because people have become dull of hearing. You know, you look at Galatians 5 and 7. Paul wrote to that church, the Galatian church, he said, You were running so well. Who persuaded you from the truth? You know, how do you overcome evil? How does scripture say to overcome evil? By doing good. By doing the opposite to what evil does. When we see heresy in the church, and when we see corruption in the church, should we just go along with it? Or are we to be radically different? If we're to be the true body of Jesus Christ, which we are, because we believe in him, is it not our duty to abide in truth and abide in Jesus Christ and continue on in him? Is it our duty to close our minds off to what scripture says and just say, well, I, I don't believe that. So, I don't, I don't believe it, so you're interpreting it wrongly. Sometimes, as Damien Pickett has repeatedly said, sometimes it is not an interpretation. It's what the text says. That's not always the case with everybody, but that is what the text says. You were running so well, who persuaded you from the truth? Someone came in and corrupted them away from the truth in the Galatian church. And that was, that was the original church. You know, people think, oh, in the end times, you know, the church is going to get bad. And it's going to get bad, and it's going to get bad, and they're all going to deny the truth. It, it was right at the beginning. It went wrong at the beginning. We think, oh, let's get back to the first century church, shall we? What do you want to get back to that for, really? It was just as bad. The Galatian church was trying to get persuaded over to believe that you have to be circumcised in order to be with Jesus Christ. Paul says, circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping the commandments of God is what counts. That's our duty, to keep the commandments. And there has to be, are we going to be like that? There has to be an increase of knowledge of God, not a decrease. If you look at Colossians, Colossians 1, 9 to 10. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with knowledge of his will in the wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Is there any decreasing in the knowledge of God? Is there any point in any part of the Christian life where we say no? I found everything I need to know about God now. And that's it. I'm going to stay here. Or is, or is there an increasing to the knowledge of God? That was what Paul's prayer was. Even them people. What, what, what did Paul teach them? You know, you think, oh, if Paul, was in, if Paul was the pastor of this church, we'd certainly know a lot. Right, well, you know, he was with those people. And he was still telling them to increase in the knowledge of God. Some people are more keen, and I would say this, but some people are more keen to learn information about what people are doing rather than they are to learn about God. And that's exactly what Paul says in, in 2 Timothy. If we look at 2 Timothy. Second Timothy 6 to 7. Uh, chapter 3 For this sort are they which creep into houses and, and led captive silly women laden with sins led away by diverse lusts ever learning but never able to come into a knowledge of the truth There's a wrong kind of learning and people, that context is about people just learning and what did they learn? Rather than learn about God what do they do? They go in to other people's houses and talk about them, talk about what everybody else is doing. And they're ever learning. You know, how many times have you heard that scripture quoted out of context? That's not about science. That's not about philosophy. That's about gossip. 
That's about going in and learning about what other people are doing and gossiping about what other people are doing. And you're learning all of this all the time, but you're never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. We're not to be like that. We are to be sober-minded, like Peter says. 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. This is what we're to be like. Wherefore, gird up the lines of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's a commandment, and even in that context, that's not just completely reliant upon Jesus Christ and saying, He is our holiness, I accept that. Can't you see there's an obedience there in that context? That it's our duty to not fashion ourselves after the course of this world and the lusts of this world, but to be holy in all manner of conversation. We are to be a people who, like Paul instructed Timothy to study and rightly divide the word, word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, 2 Timothy 2, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. That's what we're put to be. We're not to be like the people here, the Hebrew people who have become dull of hearing because we've closed our minds off and we have filled our minds up with so much junk and filth from this world that we can't even get to the knowledge of God anymore because the world is just playing, playing games and playing videotapes in our brains so much so that every single word, every single thought that you have goes to something of the world because you've got so much of the world in you we're not to be like that. We're to be a people who the words reflect what God has already said to us. We're to be knowledgeable of God. Why? And why should we be like that? Doesn't it sound like we're just to be religious maniacs and fanatics who just walk about singing hallelujah all day? No, it is quite simple. It's better. It's better than the world. Jesus Christ is better. Why would you suddenly eat tin food when you can eat the great homemade food that's proper? Why would you eat a bad restaurant when you can go and eat a good one? Why then would we have the muck and filth of the world and have it corrupt in our minds when we can have the grace and the beauty of the kingdom of heaven? Because heaven is here. I know we often think that heaven is just up in the sky, but Christ didn't just come to get people into heaven. He came to get heaven into us. You realise that? For you, for you, yours is the kingdom of heaven. We're already, in some sense, we're already in heaven now. But heaven is filled with God. It's not filled with the world. The lesson that we can learn from there, from the Hebrew people, is don't be dull of hearing. Don't shut yourself off to the knowledge and the learning of God. But say no. I'm not going to fill my head up with knowledge of this world so much so that it takes dominance over the knowledge of God. Now I'm going to say I want to learn more about God because I do. I've done two degrees in theology. I've been following Jesus since I was 12 years old and I still want more knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that was to my knowledge because I don't recall ever in my entire life ever not believing in Jesus Christ ever. 42 years old now still following Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's great. Is the greatest. And I've seen the world, I've seen the, the effects of the world, I've seen all the things that the world can offer and it's just just needs more and more and more. You just need more of it. Then it doesn't satisfy. But the more you have of Christ, the more he satisfies and takes you out of the world and takes you into himself. Amen.